Hey there, teachers. Happy Thursday night. Happy weekend almost. Some of you may be on the weekend if you have off tomorrow for the Veterans Day long weekend. Um, I am coming to you live tonight on our Thursday night meetup that we've been doing for the past um, six or seven weeks or so. So um, if you're joining me tonight, welcome. I'm just going to get our stuff all set up, make sure we are good to go and live. And it looks like we are good. So um, again, welcome. My name is Rachel Parlett. I am the author of The Classroom Nook. And um, you can find me at classroomnook.com. And that's where I post every single Wednesday um, to give you new tips and strategies, things that you can use in your classroom, or maybe even some helpful reminders. So I'm going to pull up my stuff here, make sure we are good. All right, perfect. All right, so tonight I'm going to share with you some of my top, or my top 10 takeaways from an awesome, awesome conference that I went to this past weekend, or Sunday through Wednesday, actually, um, in Philadelphia. It was the annual Con it, the annual conference for middle level education. I can never get that right, but that's what it's called. And so I don't know if any of you have ever been there. If you've been to the conference before and maybe you were even there, give me a thumbs up or a, um, a shout out in the comments. I'd love to know if you've been to it. It's for, um, it's for teachers, grades five through nine, but I'll tell you, I taught fourth grade mostly, and I had some super valuable takeaways that apply to kind of classrooms across the board. So and I'm going to share some of those with you tonight. So um, as we get started, I just want to, if you at any point find anything that we are talking about helpful, I would love for you to share that out. I ask um, anybody or each week if you find the information that I'm sharing with you valuable to please pass that on to your teacher friends so that we can get more teachers informed and educated um, with some what's going on in education today. So you can do that by clicking on the share button that's right below this video. If you press share, you will be good to go. Hey, Mindy, thanks for coming. You've been a faithful Thursday nighter, so thanks for coming. Um, and if you can hear the wind, it's super windy today, so I'm not sure if that'll pick up or not, but it's been, we the temperature is dropping and it is time for fall officially. But anyways, what is AL? A-M-L-E, if you have not attended it before, like I said, it is a conference for educators for te who teach grades five through nine, and it goes all over the country. This week, uh, or this year, it was in um, Philadelphia. Next week, I guess it's in Orlando, which would be amazing and so much fun. Um, so again, if you've been there, let me know uh, what what city you also what city you went in if you've been there in the past. But it was just great. There were probably a thousand teachers or more that were there. Um, and just learning so many different things. So I'm going to share with you my top 10 takeaways that I learned um, kind of from all different uh, sessions that I attended. I picked a lot of sessions that were focused on um, like participation in the classroom or student motivation, um, building relationships, things like that, because it's so big in the classroom right now. So you're going to see a theme as I go through some of my top 10 that they kind of go along with that theme. So let's go ahead. Number 10, I want to dive right in so you can get onto your weekend. Number 10 is the 10 by 2 rule. So I don't know if you've ever heard this rule. It was new to me, although the concept, concept wasn't um, something that I hadn't heard about before, but it kind of gave it some really good perspective. So it's called the 10 by 2 rule. And what it is, is you it, it helps you build better relationships with your students. So what you are to do, take that student that you um, maybe have had a rough patch with, um, or you haven't really connected with this this year, and take 10 days, pick 10 days, consecutive days, that you are going to positively interact with them for two minutes. So maybe it's um, at, the, at the beginning of the day to set your day off on, a, on the right tone. Maybe it's going to be um, if you have like free time at some point during the day, you can connect with them or even at the end of the day and kind of set them out for, send them off for the rest of their day at home. So the idea behind it is that it takes um, 10 days, at least 10 days, for you to change that student's perspective of their relationship, of your relationship with them. And it makes sense. And there was a lot of studies that were done um, on this kind of concept that you have to make an effort and be very intentional about how you interact with students. And you can do this with any student because any student can use a positive interaction 
from their teacher, but really picking out those students that maybe you haven't, you've had kind of a rough start with. It's November now, we've been in school for a few months, and um, I know I can think back to some of my years where I didn't really make that connection with some of those students um, throughout the year, and then it got to be at the end of the year, and I really kind of felt like they fell through the cracks a little bit. So I, this is a really good reminder, and it's very concrete. 10 days, two minutes a day, if you can do that with your student, um, or several students that you really want to build a better relationship with. So I love that idea. And maybe it's something you can start using in your classroom, picking that one kid that you might already have in your mind that um, you could use this relationship builder strategy with. So that's number 10. Number nine is answer echo. I think I had heard about this before, but had forgotten about it. And I don't, maybe it wasn't called this before. 80 degrees in Florida, that's not fair. Ah, oh, that's so cool, Mindy. Awesome. Um, last night, I that. Answer echo. So what this is, is you have a question that you're asking the whole class. And this is a strategy to kind of um, take, to kind of, eliminate that one student that always answers every question and never gives any other student a chance. And so what you would do is you ask, you pose a question to your class and you call on any student, maybe you have popsicle sticks that you use or however you might call on students and you say to them, after you ask the question, do you want to answer or echo? So if they know the answer, they can answer it. So again, you're gonna probably wanna to try to call on those kids that are a little bit more reluctant to participate and ask them, do you wanna answer? If they say no, or, or ask them if they want to answer or echo. If they say answer, they give you the answer and you move on to the, your ne next part of your discussion. If they say echo, that means they don't know the answer and you ask them to stand up. Then you go to the next person. You want to answer or echo. If they say echo, they stand up and you keep going down the line until you find somebody who wants to answer. Now, once you find the student that answers it and if they answer it correctly, you have all those other students that stood up that said they wanted to echo, repeat, echo that answer so they didn't get off the hook by not wanting to answer you had to, they had to still answer the question and on top of that they got to hear actually everybody in the class got to hear the answer over and over and over again as each student who chose to echo echoes that same answer now of course you want to make sure that the student that answered it answered it correctly before you have everybody else echo it that's a no-brainer but it just it it takes um, it let, doesn't let the student off the hook if they say, I don't know, or whatever. And there's actually another strategy I'm going to teach or share with you later that um, will not also let them off the hook as well. So that's a really cool strategy that I thought was fun. And again, you ask the student, they choose to answer the question if they know it or echo if they don't know it and once it's been answered. So that's answer and echo. You can use that right away tomorrow in your classroom. Number eight, paper airplane. So we as teachers... Um, we like to make everything super engaging and interactive, but that's not always possible because A, it takes a ton of time on your part to put together those engaging and interactive activities, um, and B, you don't always have the time for a really elaborate activity. So what you will do, what one thing that you can do is do this activity called paper airplane. And this, all it requires is a worksheet. Sometimes we just have to use worksheets because we need to have that quick assessment or whatever. So what the students will do is you give out whatever worksheet and you can use, use this with absolutely any content area, no matter what you're teaching. And the student gets the worksheet, they put their name on it, and then they answer just the first question. So I'm thinking using this like in say a math setting where you have a worksheet of a bunch of uh, multiplication problems on it. And what they would do they put their name on it, they answer the first question, and then you actually let them make an airplane out of it. So you really, the students are going to love that because you're always telling them no airplanes, right? But now you're actually letting them do it, but it's going to be in a control, a controlled and structured environment. They make their paper airplane and then they toss it across the room and they pick up somebody else's airplane. And what they'll do is open that person's airplane paper, the person's name is on top, so they know whose it is, and they answer the second question fold it back up into an airplane, toss it off, do it until all of the questions on their paper has been answered. So each question on the worksheet has been answered by another student in the class. Now you might be thinking, well, that's kind of, that's not gonna help you as the teacher very much because when you get that student's paper, it doesn't have what they answered, it has only the first problem, 
that they answered and then everybody else in the class that answered it. But here's the really, really cool part about this strategy. You are going to have your students, after it's gone all around and every question has been answered, they get their own paper back, so they make sure they have, you got to make sure they have their name on the paper. They get it back, and they are still responsible for every answer on that paper. So what does that mean? That means that they have to go back and they have to check the work of what their other classmates did. So I love that idea because they um, they kind of have to think through the problem. You have to you as the teacher are going to really know if they understand it because they're going to be able to check each other's work, and so the student. Um, ideally will not be handing in the paper if there's an incorrect answer on it. Now, of course, some are going to slip by, but that really tells you, gives you a lot of information about their understanding of the concept. And again, you can do this with anything. It probably would work best if it was a worksheet that required just quick short answers or maybe a sentence or a phrase rather than like say short answers. Um, but you can use it really with just any concept. So that is number eight, paper airplane. Again, use it tomorrow in your classroom to kind of spice up your worksheets. All right, Plickers. Now, I know some of you probably have heard of this, but Plickers kind of got popular after I um, left the classroom, so I didn't really get to use it, and I had heard the buzzword, and I'd heard other teachers talk about using it, but I didn't really get a chance to use it myself. I didn't, didn't get a chance to use it myself. So I went to a session um, that was called the mostly paperless classroom. And of course, um, there were things like Google Classroom in there. And one of the other ones was Plickers. So if you are not familiar with Plickers, let me just quickly show you what it is. It's um, a great option if you do not have access to a lot of technology. I know in my own school, I always would get super um, jealous of my other teacher friends in other districts who had you know, we're starting to get Chromebooks in their classrooms and laptops and things like that. And we did not have, we had one cart for the whole school. So it was really difficult um, for me to kind of incorporate a lot of technology in my lessons because we didn't have access to it all the time. So this is a really great option if you don't have a lot of technology in your classroom, but another way to kind of put technology in your classroom because all you need is just your smartphone. You just need your smartphone or one other device it could be um <coughs> excuse me like a iPad or something that you can scan with so you go to plickers.com and you sign up for an account and it'll walk you through like how to actually um, get your students on on your account so you can use this with your students but it's free you go to plickers.com and then what you do is you have these different cards that you print out and um, you they look like weird little squares kind of with chunks missing and each side of the square represents an answer, A, B, C, or D. And then you can put an answer, you can either orally ask it or you can put it up on your smartboard or your whiteboard or whatever you use, the question. And then what students will do is they'll take their paper and they'll turn it depending on what um, answer they want to give. So if it's A, they might turn it this way. If it's B, they might turn it that way and so on. And then what you do with your smartphone is you just go quickly and you scan the room and it's an app on your phone that will then read the Plicker card on each student and you can get instant, um, uh, you can see instantly what each student had answered. It'll show up, I believe, green if they have a correct or red if they didn't have a correct. But on the smart board or the whiteboard that you're using, what the students see, all of the students' names are on the board and as you scan, they get like this little check mark next to their name that lets them know that you got their answer recorded. But it doesn't say whether they got it right or wrong. So it's still anonymous on their side, but you can see um, you can see the answer that they got and it's a quick assessment and it's just fun for the kids because they, you know, now they're, you, you're doing this skating thing across the room and it's just fun for them. It was cool for us just for me to experience it for the first time. And then um, the presenter kind of showed us how then you can use that as an assessment. So that's Plickers, um, and it's a totally free resource that you can use in your classroom. So it's great, again, if you just have one or limited um, devices, digital devices in your classroom. So give that a try. That was number seven. Number six is was from the same session, the mostly paperless classroom, called Quizlet Live. Has anybody used Quizlet Live in their classroom? I Again, it was like a random word that I'd hear every now and then, but um, I, I never used it in my classroom, so I'm not sure how new it is. But Quizlet.com is um, the website, and then there's this version of the game called Quizlet Live. And I, from my understanding, I just got kind of a brief overview of 
quizlet.com, but there's a lot of things that you can do with it. But one of the things, um, I think there's a lot of things where you can do on an individual level as far as like each student has their own account and they can answer different questions. But this is a game and it's perfect for a review. So here's what we did in, in the session. And if there's more facets to it I'm not aware of, go ahead and check it out. Um, from my Also from my understanding, I believe that there is a free version and a paid version. So check that out as well. But the idea behind the game is you do need um, an individual digital device for each student and then you divide them into groups so you can see on the screen here it says tigers bisons lions or bears you can name them whatever you want and you put a um, the kids on their devices will see a question and each group each um, student in the group has their own device and they may or may not have the correct answer on their device but somebody in their group has the right answer. So I might have, so we, we did um, famous people. And so our on our devices, it was a picture of a famous person. And then we had to choose A, B, C, or D of who that person was. So like, say a picture of Taylor Swift. And you may have Taylor Swift on your device. But if you don't, someone else in your group does. So they have to be the one to click it. So it involves 100% participation from everybody in the group so nobody can just kind of sit down and let somebody else in their group do it because they might have the answer on their device. And what happens if you look on the screen that I have here, if they answer correctly, their little circle moves across the board. So they, um, you can see in real time who's winning, I guess, the race as they go through. So, you know, when tigers answer correctly, their little circle moves a little further in the line. Then bisons might answer it and they go. And the first group to get to the end of the line wins the race. So it was just really fun. It's fast paced. It's quick. Kids love competition, right? You can't go around with competition. So um, try that in your classroom. And again, I think there might be a paid and a uh, unpaid version, but from what I understand, the quizlet.com forward slash live, you can get a free version of that. So check that out. And if you've used it, let me know in the comments. Give me a thumbs up or let me know how you've used it in your classroom because it I can see endless um, ways that you can use this in your classroom. So check that out. Quizlet Live. Number uh, five, we're going down here. Strike a pose. So fun. I love this and I can see um, kids just falling in love with this. And it's another, um, this was from a session called Worksheet Busters. And that was where the airplane one was from as well. She had all these ideas of how you can take a worksheet and make it more interactive and more fun even though you're just using a worksheet. So there's very little prep, very little materials, worksheet, and you're good to go. So strike a pose is this. You choose four different poses to represent A, B, C, and D. So you're gonna use this if there's a multiple choice um, worksheet or option for whatever it is that you're doing. So this is the one that she used, and I have her link down there. Her, her website, teachbeyondthedesk.com, is where this is from. So if you want to check out more about this, she also has a ton of other information. Go and check it out about ways you can use worksheets. But um, So let's say all the students are looking at their answers on their worksheet, or maybe you even have it up on the, your whiteboard, whatever the question is, and then students, they strike a pose to represent their answers. So they're doing like the karate kick if they want to choose A, and they're doing like the running man if they're doing D, you know, standing straight for C and kind of like the lady pose for B. So however you want to do it, you can even make your own um, poses if you want to, if you want to, if you don't like these. But what she did is she would just have this diagram above her smart board in her classroom. And then at a moment's notice, she can always pull this out and use it with her students to kind of, if she's noticing like, I'm losing my students' attention. I need them to get up and move around. She can pull out, strike a pose, and do a quick review. They strike the pose. Their brains are moving again. They're or working again. They're thinking again. They're active. And anytime you can use action, in my opinion, in the classroom, you're going to have a ton more engagement with your students, and they're going to be way more excited to be learning about what you're talking about. Even taking a super boring topic, if you add strike a pose, you're going to be good to go. So that's number five. And check out teachbeyondthedesk.com where this idea is from. And I think you can even print this poster out there. She's got lots of great resources. She was a phenomenal presenter. All right, 
four square partner, we're getting down to the last few here, four square partner is another kind of team building, relationship building between your students in your classroom. And it's so super simple. Some of you, give me a thumbs up if you have used like the clock in your classroom, like the appointment clock. Maybe at the beginning of the school year, you, um, you give your students a clock and they try to find someone, a student's to put their name at 12 and their students put a name at you know three and six and nine and then at any point during a year you could say go meet with your four o'clock appointment it's a good idea it works great but I love this little um, kind of version of it it's called four square partner and you give them four um, like a, a piece of paper I guess it would have four squares on it and you put in high five fist pump man hug and hip bump or whatever kind of fun move that you want your students to do. So what they would do is they, you, um, instead of saying like meet with your four o'clock appointment, you would say, find your high five partner and discuss X, Y, and Z, or find your high five partner and um, answer this question with them. And so they meet their, high, their fi high five partner, they give them a high five, they talk about it, discuss it, then they give them a high five back when they're done and head back to their seats or whatever direction you have next for them. So it seems so simple and kind of, like it wouldn't make a big deal, but think of the the smiles and the excitement that the kids would have with each other. It's a great relationship builder, um, when, especially at the beginning of the school year if you're starting out or and as the year goes on, um, you know, you could change up the partners so that they're not always meeting with the same high five people, the fist pump, man hug, and hip bump. Um, and again, you can choose different movements or um, actions if you want something different. But I just thought that was super fun and um, a great way to get kind of the kids excited about learning whatever you're learning. Number three is all hands raised. So the presenter in this session, um, she was telling a story about how she was getting observed by her principal. And prior to, they had like, you know, your um, pre-observation meeting with the principal. And the principal was like, I better see when I come in your classroom, I better see that when you ask a question, every student in your class raises their hand. And that was, of course, like, terrifying because you never have all your students raising their hands eager to answer the questions. You always have one or two or ten students that kind of just slump back and don't want to listen or pay attention. So her mentor teacher came up with this really great idea that um, there were three options that the students had to do. And so the teacher didn't go into the class and say, guys, the principal's going to observe us and you have to raise your hand or I'm going to get in trouble because that's not going to be effective either. And it doesn't send the right message to the, to the students. So what they came up with, they came up with a little code and the teacher presented it like this. She said, if you know the answer 100%, I want you to raise your hand straight up in the air like this, locked elbow and straight up in the air, you know, just like you would normally raise your hand. And then she said, if you are unsure of the answer or you think you might have it, I want you to raise it at a right, I'm going to get so you can see my screen, a right elbow, just like that. And Or if you have something to add, that was the other thing. If you didn't know or if you had something to add, you could put it at a right angle. And then she said, if you don't know the answer at all and you don't want me to call on you because you don't know the answer, you're going to put your thumb to your head like this. And so... She did that with her students, and I guess it worked great for the observation, but then what she, and then she was going to forget all about it and be, go back to, you know, regular teaching, don't even worry about it. But what happened was the teacher realized that it was a great assessment, like across the board, of where her students stood with whatever she was asking or discussing. Because she could tell those students that knew it right away. She had the answer, and she could call on any one of them. She had the students who were maybe unsure or they had a question about it or something to add because they had the right angle. And then she had the students that she knew did not know the answer. So they would do the thumb to the head and they would, um, you know, she could respect that maybe they didn't want to answer it at that point. So it was a really great scan of the room to see where the students were at. So she kind of ended up using it all year long because it was just just that, a great quick assessment. So um, that's called all raised hands and you can use that in your classroom. Number two, now this goes really well with just the previous one. It's called, but what I do know is, because you know you always have those students where you say, you ask them a question and they say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, right? Always, all day long, you have that one student. So she was tired of like letting those students off of the hook. So what she did was, she said to her students, okay, you do not have to know the answer. You don't have to tell me that you know the answer. But what you do need to say is, 
But what I do know is, and they have to give, they can tell the teacher anything that they know about that topic. So let's say they are talking about the American Revolution and they're talking about one of the battles and the teacher asks the students, you know, what was the main goal of the battle or who won the battle or what was the major effect or result of the battle and the student can say I don't know but I do know that it took place here or they could be even super super simple and give like the most basic comment but what the the idea behind it is is they're not allowed to just sit back and say I don't know and then move on they, ha they are responsible for knowing something so the students are never let off the hook completely with being um, asked a question in the classroom. So they have to pay more attention. And of course, you're going to get those students that are, who are still um, you know, defiant about it. But it's, it becomes a standard in your classroom that you're not allowed to say, I don't know. But you do need to say, but what I do know is. And of course, you have to practice this with the students. And you have to let them know that what they do say has to be somewhat related to the American Revolution. So they got to give some fact about it. So that's a really cool strategy to um, encourage all participation, no student off the hook. And so finally, number one, all of these things that I um, was, were tell was telling you tonight, 10 through 2, all come down to one thing. And hopefully you saw some of these, um, saw this theme as I was going through it. And it's that relationships come first. This was like my biggest takeaway, not just in one session, but all of them combined. Relationships come first and everything else comes second. If you don't take the time to build a relationship with the students that you are working with, everything else is not going to fall, everything else is going to fall apart. And I know that for myself, I was super guilty of this in my classroom. I worked in a very high needs district a ton of behavioral issues and I kind of wanted to be that like master you know disciplinarian because quite honestly a lot of times I was just terrified of what would happen if I wasn't that way I had to be that way and I actually remember my first year teaching one of the teachers that I worked with said don't let them see you smile for the first month and I thought that was awful that was such a terrible um, way to kind of go about your teaching because that doesn't send a very good message to your students either and as a first-year teacher, you don't know. Um, but what I did learn was that if you don't take your time to build the relationship, the students are going to just write you off. And that's kind of where at that, that number 10, um, if you missed it when I was here at the very beginning, that 10 by 2 rule. Take 10 days to consistently and consecutively 10 days meet with a student that you're struggling with. And interact with them positively for two minutes. Because if you think about all the times that we interact negatively, where we're like, stop doing that, put your, you know, put your papers away, stop talking, blah, blah, blah. Those are the things that they hear for, you know, six hours a day from you, another teacher, a principal, someone in the hallway. And so those two minutes, think about how powerful those two minutes will be that will stand out above all those other minutes that maybe were not so positive. They're going to really stand out that much more and the students are going to little by little start building that connection with you. So that was my biggest takeaway from everything. It kind of just was like a, a theme that was woven into every session that I went to. Relationships come first, everything else comes second. And if you spend the time to build those relationships, teaching the content later on goes so much easier. Just like you know teaching routines and um, procedures at the beginning of the year. Take the time to do it so that the rest of the year can move smoothly. Take the time to make the relationships so that you can become a family as you work through the year. So those are my biggest takeaways, 10 through one. If you missed any of them because you jumped in late, hop back on after we get off here and rewatch them because there are some really valuable tips that you can um, use tomorrow. There's These are kind of no prep tips except for the Plickers and the, um, the Quizlet Live. Most of the other ones are just like little strategies that you can use right away in your classroom. So again, if you found this information valuable, please share it with your teacher friends and um, let them know so that we can get the word out. We have one more week next week of our fall series. Um, that's the week before Thanksgiving already. Is it really? Wow. I can't believe it if we're that close already. But um, 
we're going to take a break during the holidays because I know you're going to be busy and I'm going to be busy. And then we will start our winter series. Um, I don't have a specific start day yet, but sometime in January we'll start our um, winter series. And I really enjoyed meeting with you guys each Thursday and the feedback has been awesome. So meet me one more time next week for our final uh, Facebook Live series for the fall. But don't forget, you can always meet me um, at the cla at classroomnook.com. Every Wednesday, I have a new post out with for you with new information and ideas for you to use in your classroom. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. Again, if you have off tomorrow for a long weekend for Veterans Day, enjoy your time off, and I hope it's a nice, relaxing evening. Thank you so much for joining, and I will check in with you guys next week. Take care.